Okay, welcome to another discussion of medical ethics. Uh, today we're going to be thinking about a serious topic, but a really important one, and that's about the relationship between mental health problems and involuntary committal. Uh, this is an issue that's important uh, because A, we need to take mental health seriously, and B, uh, we also need to think about patient rights. Uh, so this discussion will see uh, how we can make our thinking coherent about these important values. Uh, so the plan today is to discuss the fifth chapter of our brief textbook that we're going to be using for the course, uh, A Very Short Introduction to Medical Ethics, Second Edition by Dunn and Hope. Um, and the question that we're going to be asking is, do policies involving involuntary psychiatric detainment or involuntary psych psychiatric committal, do these policies make any sense? Uh, now, Dunn and Hope tell us that they're going to play the role of the gadfly in this chapter. When we're talking about the gadfly, we're talking about somebody who is emulating the role of Socrates as he acted towards the people of Athens. Right. So the gadfly takes on this role of asking questions that encourage people to be less complacent about the way things are done in society. Uh, so let's see if we can get a sense of the challenge that Dunn and Hope are going to raise for society and perhaps the reader of the chapter. Uh, we'll get into this question by doing a bit of a warm up. We might ask the question, is it morally okay for healthcare providers to treat a patient against their will uh, for the sake of promoting what's good for the patient? And the classic case uh, we often hear about is the Jehovah's Witness patient, patient uh, practicing members of the Jehovah's Witness faith, uh, will not accept blood transfusions, and they will not do so on the grounds that they find it to be forbidden by scripture. Uh, so we could imagine a case, right? An EMT encounters a patient who is bleeding out and they come to learn that the patient is a Jehovah's Witness and is able to tell the EMT that they will not accept a blood transfusion. Now we might ask the question, would it be okay uh, for the EMT to transfuse the patient anyways for the sake of saving the patient's life. Now you can ask yourself this. I'll report to you that most of the time when I talk about this case with my students, uh, they will say it is not okay uh, to transfuse a patient against their will, even if that's what it takes to save their life. Now, we might contrast it with this case. Uh, think of a person who is at risk for suicide due to mental health problems. Uh, perhaps they're going through a really bad bout of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. So now the question is, would it be morally okay to involuntarily send this person to an inpatient psychiatric ward against the patient's will? Now, when I ask my students about this, maybe we could give it a question mark. Maybe there's a disagreement about this one, but I would say that the majority would say there's something okay in this case. Uh, but here's something that we can notice. Uh, in the general structure of both of these cases, uh, we might describe what's going on as paternalism. So when we go against a patient's wishes, these cases would be examples of paternalism. The definition of paternalism is basically going against someone's wishes on the grounds that going against their wishes would be for that person's own good. Right? Uh, you might notice in the word paternalism, it's acting paternally. Right? Well, that's no coincidence. Right? It basically means uh, to decide for a person as a parent would. In fact, parents are paternalistic towards their own small children uh, very often, 
right? So when a parent, for instance, uh, gives their three-year-old child a vaccine, uh, the child might be kicking and screaming and saying, no, no needles. Uh, but the parents might uh, t say, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to uh, give you the shot. We need you to be brave right now. That's a common uh, story we might hear among parents. And we might say that's a case of paternalism, uh, just as transfusing, transfusing the Jehovah's Witness patient or uh, committing the schizophrenic patient to inpatient treatment. Uh, so basically, the question we're left with is, well, is paternalism always bad? Uh, maybe it's sometimes bad, right? It seems clearly bad to us in the case of giving a Jehovah's Witness a blood transfusion. It seems pretty clearly all right when we're talking about giving a three-year-old a vaccine. Uh, but here's Dunn and Hope's worry. They're going to worry that it's an injustice to mentally ill people to treat them against their will on the grounds of mental illness, especially if we find paternalistic behavior towards patients intolerable in other cases. So uh, just to make this concrete, uh, you know, involuntary psychiatric commitment is uh, a very real process uh, in the state where I live and the state where most of my students live. Uh, we can see that this is uh, very much codified into legal processes. So when we have individuals showing symptoms of psychiatric problems or substance use, um, lay people can make petitions, clinicians can make petitions, um, where uh, we can claim that this person is a threat to themselves or others. Uh, magistrates can review these petitions. And in some cases, if a magistrate, that is a legal professional, somebody who's working with a judge, uh, determines that this person meets certain conditions, they can uh, place a custody order. Uh, officers will then pick that person up from wherever they are. Uh, they will be given a second exam. There will be a hearing in front of a judge within 10 days. And at that point, the judge might order outpatient commitment, that is treatment from the patient's home, uh, substance use commitment, or further inpatient commitment. Or a judge at that point might simply order that the patient uh, be released, that they are not dangerous enough to themselves or others. But what we're seeing here is we might have a certain amount of paternalism built right into the law uh, when we have it uh, legally the case that a person could demonstrate certain uh, mental health symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, that mean that they can be uh, involuntarily placed in something like inpatient treatment and perhaps for an indefinite amount of time. So. There are a couple of concerns about this kind of approach. Here's the first concern uh, that Dunn and Hope offer us. Uh, and they're going to point out that it's actually very hard to draw a line around what sorts of traits and behaviors should count as mental health issues. Uh, so we have a term mentioned in the textbook called drapetomania. And this was an affliction that was coined uh, by a Dr. Cartwright in 1851. Think about what was going on in America in 1851. This is before the Civil War. Uh, and uh, here's what the condition is. Uh, it is the desire of enslaved people uh, to escape the people enslaving them. So in fact, from our vantage point in 2024, this seems uh, completely unjust and unfair, right? Of course, people who are enslaved uh, don't deserve to be enslaved. And we might say a desire to escape is a completely natural response uh, to the situation 
that enslaved people find themselves in. So that might be a case of uh, a non-illness being counted as a mental illness and it being used to abuse people. Uh, or we might be using certain kinds of diagnoses to uphold unjust structures within our society. Uh, homosexuality, that is being lesbian or gay or bisexual, uh, that was listed as a mental disorder in the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, also known as the DSM. Uh, so that was the DSM-1 published in the 1950s. Uh, there have been several editions of the DSM since then. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, 1973, so about 20 years into the uh, institution and use of the DSM, uh, that psychologists were able to recognize that um, there's nothing disordered about being homosexual. Uh, it's simply a different way of being that is you know, neither better nor worse. Uh, so not a disorder. And within this kind of context, I don't hope we're going to say there are a lot of ways that people can be that might be thought of as mental disorders, but which are not truly so. Uh, they note that the current version of the DSM still has fetishism, having certain kinds of sexual responses uh, listed as mental disorders. It might be the case that in subsequent editions of the DSM, that might be removed completely. We should notice that what we count as a mental disorder can be ethically problematic, even in voluntary cases. So when we go back to the textbook, uh, Dunn and Hope briefly discuss uh, conversion therapy. Uh, so this was a kind of therapy uh, that many gay and lesbian people uh, were subjected to. And sometimes conversion therapy was a treatment that was subjected to gay and lesbian people voluntarily. Uh, they felt a certain amount of shame about their sexual orientation and tried to use uh, these pseudoscientific methods available to them to try to change their sexual orientation. Uh, what was found is that A, uh, conversion therapy does not work. Uh, and it was also eventually found that B, uh, it is incredibly traumatic for the people who go through it. This is why uh, conversion therapy nowadays is completely illegal in many cases. But Dunn and Hope point out that it's not just involuntary treatment, but when we have the wrong categorizations of things as mental disorders, it can be ethically harmful, uh, we might say uh, ethically problematic because harmful, uh, even in cases where patients are voluntarily receiving a treatment. So that's their first problem. Here is the second problem that Dunn and Hope see with involuntary psychiatric detainment. And this is the comparison that they draw between involuntary psychiatric detainment, which is one method of preventing harm to society at large, as compared to criminal law. So one thing that Dunn and Hope note is that for many criminal acts, uh, you know, uh, felonies such as murder, uh, to be considered criminally responsible for something, it's necessary to meet both the conditions of, uh, here's some fancy Latin, actus reus, which means to have done something that's against the law, and to also have mens rea men's mental, and rea meaning guilt. Uh, this means having a guilty mind. So we might think that to be criminally responsible for something, you need to do something that's against the law, and you have to do so um, intentionally or with a certain disregard uh, to the law. Now, this means that you cannot be convicted for merely thinking about doing something bad, right? 
It's not a crime to simply desire to rob banks. That is a certain kind of guilty mind, we might say, uh, but there's no actus reus. There is no guilty act. So therefore, uh, you cannot uh, be arrested by the police uh, for simply desiring to rob a bank, let's say. Uh, it's also noticed that uh, part of mens rea, to have a guilty mind, uh, you need to knew, know what you're doing uh, with a clear-eyed understanding of what you've done. So if you are considered legally insane, uh, that means that even if you do something wrong, uh, you might not be held criminally liable. Right? A uh, famous case uh, that goes back to England was a figure named David, David McNaughton. Uh, McNaughton uh, attempted to kill the leader of the opposition party and ended up killing one of his assistants in the process. Uh, but it was eventually learned that Mr. McNaughton uh, did so because of schizophrenic delusions. So even though he committed the guilty act, did not have a guilty mind according to the law. And this is why uh, courts in subsequent years tried to work out conditions for when a person can be considered not legally responsible on the ground of insanity. Uh, this general idea uh, has been codified, right? So if we look to the European Convention on Human Rights, for instance, you cannot be detained for a crime you haven't committed yet. Uh, so that's like you can't be detained for wanting to rob banks. Uh, you may have heard of this science fiction movie called Minority Report. Uh, within that movie, a supercomputer is able pr to predict that people are going to commit crimes before they've done them. And then it then captures them and locks them up ahead of time. Uh, of course, this scenario is considered to be a bad thing. This is considered a dystopian future, right? It's the opposite of a utopia. And so we might think that it would be a problematic violation of human rights to detain people for crimes they haven't committed yet. And the European Convention also says, you must be allowed back into your community once you serve your sentence. So if you rob a bank and you're given a 10-year sentence, the European Commission says that person can't be further held in jail for an 11th or 12th or 15th year uh, simply because we have good reasons to think that this person is going to get back into the bank robbing business. So uh, you cannot uh, extend sentences. It is true that some uh, crimes involve a life sentence, but uh, when we have sentences that are less than life, we can't extend them further. But then Dunn and Hope are going to contrast this with the psychiatric case. With the psychiatric case, you can be held uh, for the mere risk of harming others. Uh, and even though maybe they expect when you're brought in for psychiatric care, uh, they only expect to keep you for three months. If they at three months decide you need another three months, they'll just keep you there. So we might think of this as uh, both detention for uh, misdeeds not yet committed, and we also have extensions of the involuntary commitment in the psychiatric case. And this is the problem that Dunn and Hope have uh, with the way that things are being done right now. We don't tolerate this. We see it as a human rights violation when we're dealing with criminals, but when it comes to people suffering from mental illness, uh, these things that we're doing are somehow not treated as human rights violations. Uh, so we're left with the question, is this justifiable and done in hope are ready to say, no, they don't think it is justifiable. So, as philosophers do, they've sort of made their case uh, for being against involuntary psychiatric detention. 
And this is what good philosophers will do. They will try to get a sense of what the main objections to their view might be. Some of these might be actual objections, some of them might be hypothetical objections. Uh, but here are the sorts of objections that they anticipate. One, that mentally ill people are more dangerous. Two, the certainty of harms is greater in the psychiatric case as compared to, say, uh, the person who simply desires to or plans to rob a bank. Three, the longer the period of attention, the greater the improvement of mental health and the more likelihood that the harms to others is reduced. And four, uh, detention is what the patient would want if they were well. We might think about this as saying like, look, uh, my authentic self, uh, myself when I'm not in the grips of uh, a bipolar episode or when I'm not in the grips of schizophrenic delusions, I would prefer to be held back and to be prevented from harming people in the ways that I might. So those are four possible defenses of psychiatric preventative detention that Dunn and Hope consider. They think that they have replies to all four of these points where they're basically saying you might object to our general argument that psychiatric detention for patients who will not voluntarily accept it is wrong. Well, we can give replies to each of these objections to our thesis. So here's how they're going to reply to each of them. The first two take a similar structure. So one claim is that mentally ill people are more dangerous, and two is the claim that it's more certain that people with psychiatric illness are going to harm people than in the case of people who conspire to commit crimes. Well, one thing that they're going to point out, and this is uh, that, you know, let's compare apples to apples here. If we have equal levels of certainty in the criminal and the psychiatric case, uh, they still think that there's a double standard uh, because, uh, you know, we'll say like, look, even if there's a really good chance that a person is going to commit a crime, the criminal law says we can't punish that person until they've actually done something wrong, until we have that actus reus. Uh, and they may well also make the claim that it's not necessarily the case that mentally ill people are more dangerous or that it is more certain that harms are greater. These things are hard to know. Uh, and really, they're beside the point, uh, because it seems that the way that the law is structured is even if we hold these things equal, uh, the law is going to have a double standard. All right, so that's the first two objections. Here's three and four. Uh, sometimes it's said that the longer a period person is held for, the more we're going to get an improvement in mental health, uh, and the more uh, harm likelihood is going to be reduced. Uh, well, Dunn and Hope point out here, if it's not okay for criminals, uh, it doesn't make sense in mental health cases either. And we might get into an argument about the facts. Uh, many psych wards are not happy places, and we might think that these might not be likely places for a person uh, to get better. Uh, but we might take either of those approaches. It seems to tell against the third point. Now, Dunn and Hope even though they disagree with all four points, they do say that the fourth point is probably the best one. This point about uh, some people with psychiatric disorders will be glad that there was paternalistic behavior uh, towards them. They're glad that they were stopped from harming others. Uh, and many people who suffer from mental illness will say like, look, I would want you to restrain me if I were mentally well. Now, it might be one thing if a patient signs an advance directive which says, if I become incompetent uh, in situations X, Y, and Z, 
uh, due to my illness, that you can detain me. But many people with mental illness have no such advance directive. Right? And Dunn and Hope further point out that for many people with mental illness, for instance, those with personality disorders, it's not as if there's a clear-headed person who can make their authentic wishes known. Uh, and for many people, uh, we just can't really make a plausible assertion about what a person's authentic wishes truly are. Uh, so this appeal to what a person would want if they were well uh, might be an appeal that doesn't really get that much traction in the real world. So even though they admit that maybe it works in some specified cases, as a general defense of psychiatric detention, it doesn't work. Uh, it's really reverting back to paternalism. And Dunn and Hope even call uh, the situation that we find with involuntary psychiatric detention a double injustice. One is that it involves a violation of human rights of preventative detention. Criminals have a right not to be preventatively detention, but mentally unwell people do not have that right. So that's the first injustice. The second injustice is the way in which uh, involuntary psychiatric detention is paternalistic. Uh, we go against people's wills on the grounds that we're doing what's for their own good. Dunn and Hope see that as a certain kind of injustice, much as many people see it as an injustice when we involuntarily transfuse a patient uh, with blood when they are Jehovah's Witness and refusing that blood transfusion. So here's a little passage from the end of the chapter. Dunn and Hope say, we conclude that if we think it's morally right for society to preventatively detain mentally ill people who present a certain level of risk of harm to others, then we should do the same for those who are not mentally ill. Conversely, if we think preventative detention is an unacceptable infringement of human rights in the case of people without mental illness, it is an unacceptable infringement of human rights for those with mental illness. They say, we leave it open which way we ought to go. So they seem to be pointing out that if this is a true double standard, and I suppose a double standard which is not justifiable, uh, we should go back to a single standard system. Either be against preventative detainment for everybody. That is, we shouldn't do it to criminals, so we shouldn't do it to people with mental illness. They say another option to go might be, well, if we can do it for mentally ill people, then we should be able to use those same arguments uh, for people who we deem likely to commit crimes. Uh, now, a third way, we might say, is to spot an important difference between psychiatric detention and uh, criminal punishment. And uh, that would go against Dunn and Hope's arguments about double standards, but I suppose that is the other way. Dunn and Hope think that they've ruled it out, which is why they think that it leaves us with two options of single standards that we might go with. So that's their uh, working as a gadfly, right? They think that the way that things are being done right now uh, isn't justifiable and that we need to be a little less complacent about policy. But uh, they haven't left us with the final answer. It's up to us to reflect on whether we could make the treatment of people with mental illness uh, more justifiable or more ethically coherent. So that's where we'll end for today. Uh, next time, we're going to be continuing these discussions about uh, how medical professionals uh, ought to interact with their patients. And we're going to read chapter six from Dunn and Hope, a chapter called Helping the Helper. Uh, and we're also uh, going to look at a paper by uh, Tarzia and their co-authors uh, talking about dementia, sexuality, and consent. Uh, chapter 6 from Dun and Hope is about dementia, uh, and so is Tarsia. So we're going to be thinking about uh, more instances of
patients who are sort of at the margins of coherence and competence in their medical decision making and how we might best navigate these issues. In any case, thank you for listening in today. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. Thanks.